Awudu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Welcome. This is Cultivating the Culture. It's 8 o'clock and it's Sunday, so you know it's Cultivating the Culture. I'm your guest host, Muhammad Bashir. Um, your normal host, Tariq Ibn Jamil Lang. That's that handsome fellow right up there on the screen. Uh, unfortunately, is unavailable. But hopefully, we won't let you down. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is, uh, considering that there's uh, a, a lot out there uh, that in the secular world and in the faith-based world, we wanted to figure out a way to merge concepts. And since I'm a retired lawyer, having practiced law, especially criminal law, for 30 years, and the show is Cultivating the Culture, which is based on religious and uh, 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 religious themes, uh, we decided to kind of see what we could do about merging it. And we felt like one of the best ways to merge it would be with the Floyd, the George Floyd trial, that is State, State of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin. Well, um, and so that's going to be our topic tonight. Is this an issue of uh, just secular law or is it potentially an issue of our faiths? And so considering that that's going to be the issue, as always on Cultivating the Culture, Tariq starts out with the immortal words of the late, great El Hajj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X. Let's hear from him and we'll get back to the show. Nowadays, you learn how to do is see for yourself and uh, listen for yourself and think for yourself, and then you can come to an intelligent decision for yourself. But if you form the habit of uh, going by what uh, you hear others say about someone, or going by what others think about someone instead of going and searching that thing out for yourself and seeing for yourself, you will be walking west when you think you're going east. You'll be walking east when you think you're going west. So this generation, especially of our people, uh, has a burden upon themselves more so than at any other time in history. Uh, the most important thing we can learn how to do today is think for ourselves. Uh, it's good to keep wide open the ears and listen to what everybody else nowadays should learn how to do is see for yourself and uh, listen for yourself and think for yourself and then you can come to an intelligent decision for yourself. But if you form the habit of uh, going by what uh, you hear others say about someone or going by what others think about someone instead of going and searching that thing out for yourself, and seeing for yourself, you will be walking west when you think you're going east. You'll be walking east when you think you're going west. So this generation, especially of our people, uh, has a burden upon themselves more so than at any other time in history. Uh, the most important thing we can learn how to do today is think for ourselves. Uh, it's good to keep wide open the ears and listen to what everybody else has to say. But when you come to make a decision, you have to weigh all of what you've heard uh, on it of its own and place where it belongs and then come to a decision for yourself and you'll never regret it. But if you form the habit of uh, taking what someone else says about a thing without checking it out for yourself, you'll find that other people will have you hating your own friends and loving their enemies. And welcome back. Uh, again, this is Cultivating the Culture. I'm your guest host, Muhammad Bashir. Uh, um, what I do is actually, uh, I have my own uh, show at uh, Heritage Sports Radio Network, which I do every Thursday night called The Raw Law Project. And in that, we analyze and we dissect the law so that our community, which I believe is the most undereducated community on the law and the legal process, can understand it from a perspective that they haven't gotten it in your civics class or your social studies class. And that's pretty much a practical, everyday experience from practical and everyday people who have experienced it. Uh, whether it be scholars or whether it be lay people, we try to make sure that we put the law in a perspective that would allow you to be able to focus and uh, understand exactly what's going on as opposed to the kind of stuff you get when you listen to your pundits, your CNNs, your MSNBCs, your Fox News. It's, again, that's not our job. That's not our goal. Our goal is to make sure our community is educated, not uh, indoctrinated. So, um, again, since you know that what the topic is, we're going to be talking about the uh, Derek Chauvin trial and dissecting it a little bit for you to hopefully give you some background and some understanding of it. 
Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. So let me open up the lines immediately. If you have a question or a comment, something that you saw in the trial that you didn't understand, that maybe I could get, uh, contribute to, something that you know about the trial that uh, we don't understand, and maybe you could contribute to the discourse as to what's going on here in America. Because, again, it's being broadcast as the trial that, change, that potentially can change America. I got my own opinions on that, but again, you may have your opinions on it. So, line one, 301-429-9247. That's 301-429-9247. And there's a line two, 301-306-7284, 301-306-7284. So, with that understanding, uh, and the question on the table, is this really legality that we're dealing with or is this an issue for our community of faith and I don't care what community you come from when I say our community I'm talking about you dress your own community and and determine whether or not it's just an issue that you're going to lead to the secular world or whether or not it's an issue that impacts on your faith or that is impacted by your faith all right and so just a little bit of backdrop on the case everybody should know uh, uh, because obviously this is an intelligent audience that uh, on May 25th, 2020, George Floyd was killed on uh, the streets of Minneapolis. Uh, those of you who have seen the video, have seen the knee on the neck, the three officers, the one holding the people off, etc. So you know all of that about that particular case. So let me give you a little bit of backdrop. Derek Chauvin is a Minneapolis police officer. Um, just off the top, I forget how many years he was a police officer. But within the time that he was a Minneapolis police officer, he received at somewhere in the range of 11 complaints about his conduct, many of them considered to be ex excessive force. He eventually rose to become a training officer, hmm, a street training officer with background in excessive force. I wonder how that turned out. After the death of Floyd, the uh, chief of police fired him the next day. Uh, actually fired him after the video leaked of the young girl, 17 year old, who had put her heart on the line as she watched this man uh, die, uh, cough up his last breath in front of her and her baby cousin, a uh, nine year old, uh, but she refused to stop filming and that film became viral and that viral, in my humble opinion, led to the firing of uh, the uh, Derek Chauvin and the other officers who were involved in the incident with George Floyd. Following his termination, he was charged four days later with murder. He was charged with second degree murder, meaning unintentional murder. Uh, he was charged with second degree manslaughter, meaning depraved heart manslaughter, uh, acting with reckless indifference to the value of human life, and third degree murder which is again an unintentional murder, but done in a way that where you create a risk of death. What you don't know about Derek Chauvin, I would suggest, is that at some point in this process, well, let me go through the process first and then you can understand Derek Chauvin a little bit better. When you're doing criminal work, what you wanna do is, when you step into the case, you see your defendant, the first thing you wanna do is approach the prosecutor and make sure that discovery is complete, meaning the, all the documents and all the films and everything that they have, you have, or while that process is, of information is being gathered, that you try to find out what's the best way, what's a way to resolve this matter. Um, I don't know any attorney worth his salt. In fact, you can get disbarred, uh, at least suspended, for not seeking out to a way of resolving a particular matter, especially a criminal matter. And so that you know, there was a plea on the table, a plea to third degree, third degree murder, which would have cost him anywhere between five and 25 years in prison, depending on the discretion of the judge and whatever the prosecutor and the defense could work out. It's, uh, according to reports, that's out of the New York Times, if you read the New York Times, Chauvin agreed to take that deal which would have left us without this particular trial and this particular having to see that video over and over and the particular trauma that the community of Minnesota is saying that they're going through having to watch this trial. He was willing to take the deal. The Fed stepped in under William Barr and the Donald Trump administration and killed the deal. 
They killed the deal saying that they were opening up their own investigation and they didn't want a plea to interfere with their own investigation. How a plea would have interfered with their investigation is beyond me because when you feds charge you, they fought, charge you as violating someone's civil rights, which is separate and apart and distinct from charged with murder. So the state charges you with murder, the Fed will allow them to charge you with violation of civil rights, two separate charges. This is why you saw, maybe if those of you remember, Walter Hall's trial. Walter Hall was the young, uh, was the man who was running from a police officer and the police officer shot him in the back uh, three or four or six times. Killed him and then walked over and placed a taser next to him, but without knowing that there was a civilian filming it. He went to trial in the state court and he was acquitted. The feds picked it up for him violating his civil rights, and he was eventually convicted. But he was acquitted in the state court. There's no double jeopardy there because you're not charged with the same offense. Violation of civil rights is not murder. Murder is a separate and distinct, separate group of elements, etc., so there was no double jeopardy. If they had tried to charge him with murder, then it would have been a double jeopardy question, for those of you who understand the legal concepts. 301 Four two nine nine two four seven. If you have any questions as it relates to that, so there's a plea on the table. The Fed step in and they kill it. Now, frankly, when I heard that the Feds had stepped in, I said, you know, and they stepped in prior to the election, by the way, uh, that they were looking for an incident. They were looking for a momentum increase, a emotional outburst from the black community. They were playing black people, in other words. They had no intention of charging Der uh, Derek Chauvin in the Fed, uh, but they stepped in so that they would have to, the state would have to continue to press this particular matter. Why the state fell for it is beyond me, but um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not privy to the inner workings of what went on there, but I do know that there's no double jeopardy attached and the feds have no control over what happens in the state as it relates to that particular trial. So if the state wanted to go ahead with that plea, even if William Barr stepped in, they could have gone ahead and taken the plea. So perhaps maybe William Barr leaned on them a little bit harder than uh, just to say that he was the attorney general and the Trump administration has an, an, had an agenda before they got kicked out by way of the, by way of the vote uh, that they were attempting to get across. Uh, I don't know, and you probably never know, unless William Barr confesses to why he stepped in on this case. With that, trial began, or at least trial preparation. Discovery was complete, uh, etc., and autopsy was done. As part of that particular autopsy, the person who is the medical examiner, that is the person who is actually going to handle the body, who actually did handle the body of George Floyd, issued his autopsy report. And in the autopsy report, he says that George Floyd died from a failing heart, complicated by the stress of the incident with him and the police. He didn't make a finding that the knee on the neck was a proximate cause of the stress, that the pressure on his back was a, co a proximate cause of him, his heart shutting down, that the pressure on his legs was a proximate cause, just that the heart was in such bad shape that the stress of the moment with the police activity caused his heart to fail and he died. When that came out, everybody was up in arms. Everybody was up in arms because what he did was literally take murder out of the case. The ME, literally, that is the person working for the state, the state's chief examiner, who does the vast majority of all of their autopsies and homicides and suspicious deaths and accidental deaths, is saying that the heart gave out, separate and apart, just by the stress of the incident. The state, the ones prosecuting the case, want to be able to say, as the doctor who worked on George Floyd at emergency services, for over an hour trying to revive him even though the EMS people who picked him up said they tried to revive him for 30 minutes with no sign of life. He tries to revive him but he gives a preliminary report saying that he believed that he died from asphyxiation something called hy hypox hypoxy meaning blood, the blood couldn't get to his brain, his brain shut off everything else and he suffocated 
contrary to what was the finding of the medical examiner. Everybody following me so far. That's why in your trial now you have all these experts being called by the state to hopefully get the jury to side with that he suffocated because that would mean the knee on the neck, the pressure on the back, shut down his lungs as testified by a Dr. Tobin and a Dr. Brock and a Dr. Thomas that the pressure on his chest with the back, with the handcuffs and the knee on his back and the knee on his neck constricted his ability to get air and his lungs, etc. And that is what caused his brain because no air was coming in. That's what caused his brain to shut down. Frankly, if you look at the video, you hear him say, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. You hear the young man, uh, uh, Mr. Williams, I believe his name is, saying, you're shutting off his air. I've seen that chokehold before using the knee, uh, etc. because he was a mixed martial artist. So he understands what it is to shut off areas of the neck that would stop the flow of air coming to a person. So all that is played out in the trial. And so now we're on to the issue of causation. While trial was going on, not less than seven, I think it was nine in total, including the chief of police, testified that the force used by Officer Chauvin was excessive. It, it struck me, being a practitioner, having tried similar cases, that these guys would come in and testify. When you listen to the media and the pundits, they want to tell you that this is a... Uh, 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 a, 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 a new breakdown of the blue wall of silence. <laughs> Nothing in my humble opinion could be further from the truth. In fact, all it is, in my humble opinion, is that when you listen to the testimony, a question of policy versus a question of practice. They're telling you what the pro policy is, that this knee on the neck is excessive. But they're not telling you what the practice is. In fact, one detective literally said he has used that knee technique before even though it's excessive so they were giving you the policy as if they really are testifying against Mr. Chauvin but they're not telling you what they really do on the street because on the street they had over 2200 excessive force claims against Minneapolis police officers and only 12 of them have been reprimanded not even dismissed or fired out of 2200 so you can imagine what's really going on on the street. You can also imagine that from the elderly gentleman who testified, he, who broke down on the witness stand. Those of you remember may, may remember him. I think his name was Mr. McKinley or something to that effect. Whatever it was, he was a, absolutely a compelling witness. And he broke down. But one thing that he said that everybody who is from your neighborhood or from your block should be able to recognize. And that is what he said was he saw Chauvin five days before this event. And he spoke to him on the street and he said to him something to the effect of you want to make it home to your family, make sure the next man makes it home to his. What he was really saying is what every one of us in our community says because he recognizes what's going on on the streets with the police, the aggressiveness of the police. Stop being so hard on the people. You want to go home. Why don't you make it easier for them to get home? So they, you now know from that statement alone, when I heard it, I was like, he's telling them, stop kicking our behinds on the street. The reason why I'm giving you this backdrop is because the merger tonight of, is it just something that we do secularly or is it something that we are bound to by our faiths to wrestle with? About two days before trial started, after while in the middle of jury selection, the state announced and the media announced that the family of George Floyd had settled the case, uh, the civil case. They filed a civil case for excessive force and wrongful death in the civil courts. Again, it's not double jeopardy because one is civil, the other is criminal. They filed a complaint and they settled the complaint for $27 million. That became a question to the jury as to whether or not they are tainted by that $27 million. I suggest that they were, and they are. They're thinking, as many people have voiced on Facebook, you can go on my Facebook feed. I do a daily 
rundown of the trial. I'm up to day 10 now. You can catch it up raw law. Just go there, just pop on the page and make a comment if you like uh, from day one through uh, 10. But the settlement of 27 million is being registered in some circles as, well, look, they got paid. Why are we having this trial? You know, so we'll take a look uh, again. Anybody, the number 301-429-9247. Let's hear from uh, a listener. You're on, you're on WBGR, Cultivating the Culture. Who am I speaking with? This is Angela calling about the state sanction killing you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, how are you? Where are you calling from, Suzanne? You mind if I call you Suzanne? Um, yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm calling from North Carolina. Okay, from North Carolina. Um, yeah, something's got to give. I mean, either you got to fight back or... Just let me keep going. Well, but Miss but, but, Suzanne, let me ask you, let me just play a little bit of a, of a heavenly advocate. I don't like to be in a devil's advocate, you know, I, that's yuck. Yeah. But in any event, in North Carolina, you've ha you, you got a history of this in North Carolina, these kind of incidents well, in yeah. North Carolina. I mean, we could go as far back as Reconstruction and the destruction of Wilmington, Delaware, by white nationalists and etc. and murdering of all the black people in Wilmington, right? So, but tell me this here. As part of your faith, a part of your belief system, does part of your belief system say that we have to do something about this? And, and if so, what is it? What is it a part of your faith system that says we have to do something about this? I think what needs to be done is the truth needs to be told. Mm -hmm. The reason the white males are panicking is because they know the majority in the United States is brown. But they haven't told us that. Mm -hmm. When they let Cubans and Brazilians in, if they're white, then they can check the white box. If they're brown skin, they have to check the black box. Mm -hmm. That's just adding to their numbers, but they're not real numbers. Mm -hmm. And so your 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 concept of dealing with this, which is really basically racism, white supremacy, them trying to do whatever they can to make sure they stay the majority, uh, and and stay, yeah. and therefore stay in power. But you're, are you suggesting that as part of your faith analysis, you're saying that? Uh, uh, what are you suggesting? I don't want to suggest anything to you. I mean, the truth is it, is it a know the truth and the truth shall set you free analysis? Or, or give me an idea. Uh, two things. I would like a group of virologists, all brown, mm -hmm. to explain to me how COVID can pick brown people to kill, but just get white folks to flu. There's no difference between you taking a white man's liver and his taking your kidney. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to hear some virologists. I don't hear those people on TV. That makes sense to me. That 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 makes absolute sense to me. And I thank you for your call. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. You too. Bye bye. All right. So again, um, the settlement is part and parcel of, again, what good lawyering does, uh, at least in some aspects. I don't believe settlements resolve the issue. I think settlements get people paid. Uh, but there are a couple of concepts out there. In the civil court, in the civil court, a if you file an action against a police officer, the question of qualified immunity pops up. But that's only in the civil court. Don't let anybody confuse you into thinking that they have qualified immunity in a criminal court. They don't. Right, uh, they have qualified immunity in the civil court, but they settled that case in for twenty-seven million. If somebody were to settle a case for twenty-seven million, you can imagine what they are thinking about the proofs of the case going in in a civil case. I mean, I, you don't give away twenty-seven million, so they must be thinking that they could lose a hundred million if they go to trial based on the proofs that they had. And so it makes you wonder what the nature of the proofs are against Minneapolis. Minneapolis Police Department, Minneapolis State, Minneapolis City, Minneapolis police officers that would allow them to settle at $27 million. 
also, as it relates to qualified immunity, when you go to trial or when you get to the point to where you put these guys on trial, these cops who abuse their authority and acting within the scope of their authority because that's where qualified immunity rests, an officer or a member of the state acting within the scope of their authority commits an act that injures someone, they are immune from prosecution if you can't establish that they violated a law that they knew or should have known of. And the way the courts establish that is through case precedent, meaning that there was a case out there of similar facts that they would be able to turn to and be able to say, I should not have done this. But the, every time you settle a case, it doesn't become a case precedent. So then, therefore, this is why you continue to see this qualified immunity thing, because these jurisdictions are settling these cases and not, in a lot, not allowing them to get to a courtroom whereby you can establish case precedent and thus knock out qualified immunity. So the only remedy for qualified immunity is a legislative one where the local, state, federal tried to eliminate qualified immunity, but considering that it was a Supreme Court decision, they're going to have to really do it at the federal level to say qualified immunity is eliminated. But that's just my opinion on it. Uh, the Again, this is a, a, a faith-based faith -based question. I, I know I just heard and, and, and suggested that it's an issue for some people of know the truth and the truth shall set you, shall, shall set you free. That's a concept in the Christian faith. In the Islamic faith, Islam teaches action. Question is, how does this action that you come with with Islam move you into action here on the street? Example, Shahada. Nothing has the right to be worshipped by Allah and Muhammad is the messenger. It's an action. Salah is an action. That is prayer five times a day. It's an action. Fasting during the month of Ramadan is an action. You have to do it. Saum, zakat. Zakat is charity. You have to give it unless you can't afford to give it or unless you don't fall into the criteria of those people who are making the kind of money that would allow them to give it. But you give charities in other ways, so it's an action. Hajj, you only, even only one time in your life, it's an action that you do. So every premise, every pillar of Islam is based on action. Is there action necessary from the Muslim community here in these kinds of incidents? Because, let's face it, your community is implicated in this. Your Christian community is implicated in this. Your Jewish community is implicated in this. So where are your faiths? Your belief systems, if you don't have a religious doctrine, your belief systems of justice and right conduct, if you're an a, a African nationalist, if you're a, 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 a Sikh, your concept of what is right and what is wrong, is on is it on trial is that on trial because you're standing by and watching or is it just something that your faith community says you leave to the system for the system to seek justice or are you intimately connected to this again 301 429 9247 is the number don't be afraid to call I, because i'm not afraid to answer your questions now over the last couple of days uh I, I'm, for those of you who are watching and have, have heard it, there have been a couple of things that have come up. And because they came up, I have to address them with this audience the same way I address my audience on the Raw Law Project, HSRN, shameless plug. Excuse me. Uh, police officers testifying against police officers. Uh, and pundits, that is, people analyzing what police officers have to say. Our community has bought into the acceptance of the narrative of the people who have been enemies to our community. So when Ms. Suzanne calls and she says she wants to know how it is that the virus knows how to attack black people as opposed to white people, where black people die and white people get the flu, it's consistent across the board, even with criminal justice. That the issue of whether or not you can seek redress or whether or not you're harmed is different as it relates to how you treat a black person versus how you treat a white person. In this particular instance, instance that is with George Floyd, obviously you have a man that's going to trial uh, and he's considered to be a white man. 
and he's being tried for the murder of a black man. We've seen it before, so we can't really say that this is all new to us. We've seen it a thousand times. At least the killing of a black man by a white man who happened to be a member of the state that is a police officer. But the question becomes, is it all part and parcel of what we have grown to expect because we accept the narrative that comes from another community? We accept the narrative, as Suzanne indicated, that this virus does what it does while we see the result. And we are accepting, because of this trial, the narrative that justice is being done because cops came out and testified against the cop. These cops have no desire to testify against Chauvin. Don't get that wrong for one minute. Chauvin is the sacrificial lamb. Chauvin is the guy that they're willing to give up so that the practice, they want to tell you about the policy. Uh, we go through all this training. We go through this, that, and the third. You haven't heard one of them talk about what they actually do on the street with the exception of the one who actually did the training. When he was questioned on cross-examination, he was asked, have you used this technique using the knee? And he said yes. So they want to tell you about the policy to divert you while they put the practice on your behind. They want to tell you about the virus doing this while it's crushing your community and not crushing other communities. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting balance to strike, especially considering her question brought it up. So again, 301-429-9247. Don't be shy. Don't even be shy. I'm more than willing to entertain whatever question you have. In fact, I, I should give you my Twitter feed just to make sure, but I'm going to make sure that uh, uh, that my phone is on first, and then we'll get back to, to the discussion. And here's the issue. This so-called blue wall of, of silence with officers testifying against another officer. The blue wall, regardless of what happens in this case, has not been even scratched. It hasn't been fractured. A 13-year-old boy was killed by the police three weeks ago. A grown man in St. Paul was killed, black man, um, under suspicious circumstances in uh, uh, two weeks ago. If you go through and begin to Google, you just see that this is not just a local Minneapolis thing. It's a national, it's a national phenomenon of black people and their relationship with the people who are supposed to be in charge of looking after their interests. And so this is why when it becomes a national issue and even a local issue, you have to really question where is your faith where is what is it about the faith community that the faith community isn't stepping forward to change the dynamic see because each one of us thinks within our faith we have the doctrine that changes hearts at any time this should be the time where that doctrine is stepping forward this should be the time where the doctrine is leading the charge this is the time where those people of faith should be stepping forward this is my humble opinion because again if you can't come up with a solution to a problem that existed for 400 years and apparently so-called America, so-called white America, so-called uh, white supremacist America hasn't, then either you don't want to solve the problem or you don't believe there is a problem. And you've seen that over the last four years that there's a group that doesn't believe that that's a problem. Didn't one of your senators come out and said if it had, these were all white citizens who raided the Capitol in, on January 6th. And he said what? He said, I thought they were good citizens, law-abiding citizens that wouldn't harm anybody. After they had beaten and injured over 140 police officers, threatened to kill the Vice President of the United States, came there and planted bombs around the city. Uh, uh, after all that, this is what he's saying, but he said something else too on the other side of that. If they had been Black Lives Matter, I would have been afraid. Two different ways of seeing the world. This is the way they see the world. Why would they see it any different in the George Floyd case? But because the camera caught the practice of the Minneapolis police, because the camera exposed the attitude of the Minneapolis police, Chauvin, in my opinion, 
is being sacrificed. And therein lies the problem with us accepting the narrative that this system works for the benefit of our people or that this trial is going to work for the benefit of black, so-called browns, so-called minorities, so-called poor whites. These are the victims of the system that was designed to protect all the other systems, not to protect and serve the people. So we have to come to an understanding that this particular trial is not going to change the dynamic of what policing looks like in our communities. The people who have to change it have to be us. And so therefore, our, my humble opinion again, our doctrines are literally on the line. Our faith are literally being tested. Can you imagine? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you is a statement carved out in Christian doctrine. What does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean protect someone? Does that mean stand up for your neighbor? What does it mean? And if you take that same proposition and you turn it over to Islam, in Islam they have a doctrine, basically the same concept. None of you will have believed until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. So I ask on both sides, whether it be Christian and Jewish ethic, Judeo-Christian ethic, or Islamic ethic. If, yes if, the police came up to you and they began to attack you, a police officer, and your life was on the line. Would you fight him for your life? The reason why I asked that question is because I had a discussion with some brothers and they were saying, bruh, this is not our fight. This discussion is, you, you're putting all this post up about the trial, but it's not our fight as Muslims. So I said, okay. Same question I asked them, I'm asking you. If the police came to kick your behind right now and they were 100% wrong, would you fight for your life? And to a letter, each one of them said yes. And I said then, if your brother, your Muslim brother, your blood brother, your neighbor was being beaten up by the police, could you honestly say you believe because you want for your brother what you want for yourself? You want your life to survive, that police onslaught, and you're willing to fight for it. Are you then willing to fight for the life of your brother? Ask yourself that question. Ask and see. You may say it doesn't apply. It may not. But ask yourself that question. And then if you want, call me and ask me the question. 301 429 9247. I'll be more than willing to take your calls. Now, this case, I think, again, is going to challenge all the stuff that we say we believe in. Because, frankly, I think we have really gotten to the point that we have turned our back on faith and turned our faith over to uh, our enemies, the people like the news media, the people like social media. The people like your pundits who are constantly telling you what to think about everything. This is, to me, the biggest problem with faith and faith-based initiatives in the world today. The people who are helping you define the parameters of your faith don't have the best interests of your faith or of you at their heart. Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What do I mean when I say they don't have your best interests at heart? If you live here in America for 400 years, you have seen the same or similar kind of conduct as it relates to black men by the government. You have seen sparse prosecutions, whether it had a black president or it had 100 racist white presidents. You have seen legislative enactments that were designed to curb black progress. You have seen when legislative enactments didn't work, violence to curb black progress. Brown progress. Anything to keep white 
superiority in the forefront. Our, fir our first caller indicated brown people come in, scrutinize, white uh, uh, Latinos come in, they get in from Cuba. You can't get in from Haiti. Sorry, they're even sending people back to Haiti now, which is one of the most underreported uh, 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 violations of immigration law in the country over the last six years. They're just shipping Haitians back to Haiti. Some of uh, the parents have children here, minor children, but they got to go. The violation, the willingness to change the law or to violate the law in order to keep whites higher is the rule. She said that the issue for them is that the more that they're realizing that the world and America is becoming more and more black and brown. Well, they realize that with your constitution. This is why the South fought so hard to get the three-fifths compromise in your constitution. I know it was dehumanizing to call black people three-fifths of a human being. I know. That was the indoctrination effect. But the real intent was that the South could not match the population of the North for purposes of representation in the Congress. The number of people you have determine how many representatives you get in Congress. And so, since blacks were not considered to be humans, they couldn't be counted. So therefore, the North could dominate the South by virtue of the fact that it had so many more people in New York, in whatever, in Massachusetts. So the South came up with, we need a compromise. We need to count these people, but we don't want to count them, these slaves, these enslaved people, these prisoners of war. We need to count them. So they began to count them as the compromise was three-fifths of a human being in order to balance out the representation. In order to balance out the representation. And what does it do? Every time, look at every immigration, every immigration or migration situation that you have. They open up the doors to Europe and Europeans, as President Trump said, why can't more people come in from Norway? They open them up year after year or Migration time after my immigration time for people who look and who can sign on as being white so that they can up the numbers of their uh, consensus or they shut it down because there are too many Chinese or Africans or whatever coming in. Again, all you got to do is call. Let's talk about it. We'll go to line one. Welcome. You're on Cultivating the Culture. Who am I speaking with? Uh, Salaam alaikum, this is Waqil. Salaam alaikum, Waqil. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Rattler Country, down here in Florida. Okay, from Florida. Waqil, tell me what you think about the, the issue of the Chauvin trial and whether or not we have a conflict in faith uh, in this particular matter. Is, is our faith a part of what we do here in, the, in this culture or are we secular the, or is this just a secular issue that we need to leave our faith to the side on? I think one of the problems, one, first of all, the uh, children, the children trial in and of itself is basically theater. Mm -hmm. I mean, the truth, the uh, the uh, the common sense part of this is that uh, historically, now from a historical standpoint, uh, at they're doing what they normally do, which is put it, which is put the victim on trial. That's the, uh, a very typical historical, uh, for lack of a better term, the most American thing to do mm -hmm. is that you put the victim on trial as opposed to putting the, uh, the system itself on trial. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one. I have some concerns also about some of the legal representation that I've heard as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, far be it from me, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, mm -hmm. but I do have common sense. And some of what I've heard and what I've seen doesn't really make much sense. Give me an give me an example on that. Well, first, well, uh, first of all, um, if you're going to push a narrative, well, you look at the tropes that are that are being put forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, big black man, little white cop. Mm. Okay, racial racial, racial stereotype so, one on one, right? The stereotypical the stereotypical <laughs> intimidation factor. Yeah. That you need four cops. You need uh, you need uh, four 150 pound men to control.
control a 200 pound man who by the way you have in a position where you're literally literally crushing the life out of him mm -hmm. uh using the excuse that oh i'm distracted now by a crowd who's uh pleading for the man's life uh, this is just a very basic you know just some basic one-on-one kind of thing but you talk about racism uh, 101 but this is this yeah. is exactly what it is. It's mm -hmm. like I said. It's the, it's it's a very American thing. Mm -hmm. In that, no matter what, no matter what, the victim is all, the victim typically is made out to be the bad person, mm -hmm. or the made out the victim is made out to be the criminal. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in this particular case, uh, several hundred million people watch this man die, literally die before their eyes. And we have, and there's a trial that's being done right now, and all of the stereotypical, all the stereotypical tropes are being brought to life, all of them, from both sides. This is this is the irony of it all. It's happening from both sides. Right. And, it's and, not just the defense. Mm -hmm. It's not just the defense talking about, uh, oh well, he was on drugs, he had underlying conditions, not what killed him, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. But you're looking at it from the standpoint of the prosecutors, where the prosecutor is trying to make. Is trying to put uh, put a narrative out there that uh, the behavior of this particular law enforcement officer, who has been doing this for 19 years, all of a sudden now is doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. when it is part and parcel, this is the you know this is the way it's handled. Right now, think about I I, I really I'm riding with you on that because you talk about the idea of uh, of George Floyd. He Everybody now knows that he had a drug problem. They now know that he had a drug overdose. They now know that he has been arrested on prior occasions for drugs, right? But they don't know that over 19 years that this Chauvin has like 11 uh, uh, criminal, 11 complaints against, about his conduct on the streets. And they probably will no. never know. Even if he testifies, they'll find a way to clean that up. So, uh, and, and it, it, it's like, as you said, putting the victim on trial. Well, they, and the irony of it all is the is uh, if you look at the history, you know, you look at the history in this particular case. Uh, look at the chief of police mm -hmm. and look at where he spent where he spent the lion's share of his supervisory experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, everybody else that's been on that's been on the stand. He is the one person that he's the one person that can identify uh, just how in. in well, just how, just just in the behavior of his training officer. Because the other thing to remember is uh, this former officer was a training officer, 19 years experience with a training officer as a training officer. Now, for these other three officers who were there, who I think the uh, one of them may have had more than a couple of years experience, mm -hmm. but the other two guys were brand new. Right, right. So how did he, so, how, of all the people to be a training officer, the guy with eleven complaints, and and and, exactly. and nobody nobody pushed pushed him to the back burner at that time. Uh, I mean, they recognized that he could possibly be a problem on the streets. Well, well the, and the thing that gets me is that the chief of police was the head of the was the uh, chief inspector for internal affairs for how much time? Mm -hmm. He was in internal affairs for one quarter of his entire time in the police department. So if anybody knows this guy, he does. Right. I mean, this, you know, this is just some basic common sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't even want to get to the point of uh, all of a sudden evidence shows up like it's uh, almost like it's the uh, like the old uh, the old Gil Scott Heron uh, poem where he says, you know, uh, 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 death happens in the hood. Just sprinkle drugs on him, it'll be listed as gang related, and there'll be no investigation. <laughs> Word. So that's uh. the same kind of thing that you're looking at here. You have two vehicles. That all of a sudden they're pulling evidence out of uh, four to eight weeks after the incident. Excellent analysis, Joaquin. Tell me this here to the heart, to the heart of the question. I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Okay, to the heart of the question. Tell me this. I, 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 you're a Muslim. Yes, sir. Okay, tell me about Islam in this. Does, there, well, does, does Islam have a doctrine or something that suggests that Muslims should be more active? in these kinds of incidents? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You are supposed to stand for what's right, no matter what. No matter stand who. the truth, no matter who it's for or who it's against. Period. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to right. you? What does that mean to you to stand for it? What does that mean? 
you stand for it. You stand for what is true. What is truth? What is honest? What is fair? Does you that, stand for what is true. Does that so mean you march? Does that mean? Does that mean you march? Does it mean you protest? Does it mean you fight? What does it mean? Anything you change, you change it with your hand if you can. If you can't change it with your hand, you change it with your uh, speech. And if you can't change it with your speech, you change it by hitting it in your heart. The bottom line is you do something. There you go. All right, well. You do something. Thank you so much. Appreciate the call. I got another caller coming in. Raquel, keep listening to Cultivating the Culture. Hopefully you'll tune in Thursday to the Raw Law Project and we'll weigh in some more. And you'll love your conversation. Take care of Farda for me. You hear? Yeah, that, I, that I'll do. Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah. So, you heard it there from a Muslim perspective. Do we have any uh, 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 people from the Jewish faith or the Christian faith who want to weigh in on the issue of what it is that you're supposed to do as a faith-based community? Are we a community of action or are we just a community of, of belief? belief? I always thought that the beliefs came with a belief system. That system moved you toward action, um, uh, I, which is one of the reasons. See, I grew up with icons that came through the 60s. So when you heard Malcolm earlier, then you knew that was an icon. I heard King earlier uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in another program, and that was a man of action. I don't know any of the prophets in your face that weren't men of action. I don't even know any of your followers of the prophets who weren't men of action. And so I'm wondering, where is our action in this because again we each and every day tout our doctrine are we just people of doctrine that we can just espouse words and 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 wisdom that with doctrine but we are people can't transfer do doctrine into action or are we just scared to transfer doctrine into action again this is cultivating the culture the number is 301-429-9247 don't be afraid to call in. Now, back to the trial. The over the last couple of days, again, I talked to you about the police. Over, I don't want to talk to you about the street witnesses. That was emotion. That was probably the first time that they really had a chance to just exhale after having witnessed something so horrific. And believe me, I'm, I know, having participated in these kind of trials, that these good people, innocent people, have to carry this with them for the rest of their lives. That's part of us. And therefore, part of what we hold as faith has to be to be able to help these people heal, to help them turn them over to, to the Creator, to help them come back to the community to be embraced, to put together uh, concepts and ideas and things that would allow the community to grow and to heal. This is who we are. This is who we're supposed to be. That's part of who we are as faith-based communities. Do we have that? Are we ready for that? When victims are injured and they're on the outside, let's see what the callers have to say. Uh, Welcome. This is uh, this is uh, cultivating the culture. Who am I speaking with? How you doing? <laughs> This is Tariq Lang. Hey, what's up, Tariq and Jamil Lang? I knew you wouldn't pass this conversation up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a good conversation, and um, I'm glad. And I'm, I'm glad we have an interaction, mm -hmm. and it's a good topic. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because it covers all the all the faith uh, groups. You know, I actually somebody had put a post and talking about us restoring, coming back to to what we're supposed to be on. And one of the things is, is we as the people were known as the people. Of, of, of faith, of people that fear God. What got us free from slavery was, a, was our belief in God and, and our adherence, you know, to what, what we knew of what the law of God was, or at least the best that we can do, at least the fear. Mm -hmm. And that has, you know, been removed. And like you said, when you see this type of incident and we see these things going on and we, you know, act as though this is a social issue or not, well, we got to look at it, look at our, what would Jesus do? What would Moses do? What would Muhammad do? What would they have done when that incident was happening? Yeah. And this is how we have to look at things, you know, uh, not how we're, uh, are we following according to, you know, the shadows that we do, we praise, you know, the, the this part of the examples and the actions, mm -hmm. you know, and so I, I'm loving, loving the show, man. 
Oh, great. Well, then tell me. Give me an idea. You heard Brother Wakio. I thought he weighed in very powerfully. He gave uh, 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 the idea that you change it with your hands and, and despise it in your heart and, and change it with your speech. Give me an idea. Do the, do the, do the, do the, does the Muslim community, uh, is the Muslim in community impacted by this kind of an event? I mean, you see it over and over. Are we impacted by this? And are we ready to mobilize and, and think about ways of changing the culture, cultivating the culture in a way that is willing to change because we step forward as Muslims to offer that kind of a change? Are we ready for that? Are, are we just... The thing is, is it, I, no, because the reality is, is, you know, one of the greatest things that the devil was able to do is to divide. Mm -hmm. He divides the Muslims into this group, Shia, Sunni, Salafi, this group. He divides the Christians into this group, this church, that church. And so the believers are divided, mm -hmm. right, as far as it, and, but you look at the disbeliever or the person that, that, that worships the Satan, like this, this little Nas X, going to put out this video and stuff and get the, and recruit the people. Like, Satan is one for them. Their devil is one. Mm -hmm. But God, they want to break it up into all these different ones, even go God is one. But his followers are breaking up and fighting each other while they're unified in their effort. So it's a difficult thing. Why? Because people don't recognize it. They only recognize the differences as opposed to the similarities of believing in the creator of existence, believing in the one that created that, that son, and knowing that, the, the, that we have a common enemy, and that common enemy is the devil. But as long as we look at each other as, a, as our enemies, then it's going to be difficult, you know, to be to turn it into action. It's only theory, concepts, and ideas. Very good. Have you followed the trial? You said what? Have you followed the trial? It's hard to hear you. I couldn't hear you. What did you say? Have you followed the trial? Have I followed the what? The trial. The Chauvin trial. The trial. I've, I've, I, I've, I've been looking at your notes following the trial. No, I haven't because um, I follow certain things. I listen to the certain things, but I know how the system is and, and what it is. It's like a parade. Mm -hmm. There you go, parade. The different individuals come up. You know, you have this float and that float and that float, <laughs> and that's basically what it is. But they, they have the decision who's going to be the uh, you know prime queen and who's going to be the, the queen of it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you know you know what's up. That's I mean, a, and that's such a, that's a profound. That's a great commentary. It really is. You don't even know. I, I mean, I, I wish I had like ten minutes to just dissect that because it really is exactly what's going on. You hit the nail on the head. Uh, the reason why I do these notes there is to give people an alternative way of viewing it, separate and apart from what's actually being told to them in the media as to what's going on. This is a great witness. This is what happened. Oh, this is a... No. This, you hit the nail on the head. It's like a parade of floats going around and they already have an outcome that they desire or if they don't have an outcome that they desire, they are already planned for the various outcomes that are desired. You know? And, and, it's, and to me it's so obvious because I can see the lack of lawyering and what looks like good lawyering sprinkled in there to keep the people off balance, you know, but it, but, but it's, it's and, go ahead. And yeah, no, and then the thing is, is, you know, all of these officers, you know, an officer, that's what you're supposed to be, an officer of the law, mm -hmm. which is the applying the law, that knew that this individual was not applying the law mm -hmm. at the time, and now everybody's coming in, oh, he wasn't applying the law at all, but why did, then that's your job, your job is to follow the rules and regulations, mm -hmm. not some hidden code that you have. And now they're on trial. Oh, you know, that wasn't the rules and that wasn't the regular. Well, okay, you knew that when it was happening. Right. All of y'all when you're still around and stuff. You know, you're, you're, when you took an oath, when you got trained, when you went to, to the academy, you had rules and regulations that you're supposed to follow. And you knew that that was against it. It was your responsibility as an officer of the law to go stop that individual. It was not the people's responsibility. It was yours as an officer of the law to stop that. But you use a code that you have for your brotherhood greater than the following the law. So you're all criminals in that. Agreed. 100%. Again, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, 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 but, I'm going to let you go, man. Good. All right. Go get him. I'll right. talk to you. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Let's try. Wow. Look, um, I, I, I can't wait to see what the discussion is going to be as this trial moves on. Uh, but again, this is cultivating the culture. Uh, this is the kind of programming that helps merge the secular with the religious so that you understand that you can't live one without the other. You can't live in the world... Uh, a world created by the creator of all things and not protect the world that was created by, by the creator of all things. You owe that to the world. 
This is why he made you the vice general. This is why he made you the Khalifa, so that you could control that which was going on here. And if you are allowing by your absence or by your fear, someone else to control that which Allah placed here, you here to control, then you are really letting down your faith. And I'm not sure that we are ready to answer for the fact that we might have to be asked on the day of judgment, where were we when X happened right in our midst? What was our plan when kids were psychologically damaged by these atrocious events over and over and over when we were supposed to be the Khalifa? Every shepherd is responsible for his flock. So if we're the Khalifa, everything else is the flock. But we have but the question is, are we willing and able to lead in these kind of situations? And regardless of what the verdict is, the next one is coming along. So we can't say that oh this popped up on us accidentally because it didn't pop Emmett Till didn't pop up on us accidentally. Tamir Rice didn't pop up on us accidentally. Marvin Tyler didn't pop up on us accidentally. Sandra Bland didn't pop up on us accidentally. These are event after event after event after event that is calling on us to raise at the minimum, our, to, to hate the incident at the minimum, to raise our voice if we have one, whether it be in a platform or be in a, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the pulpit or at the, or the membar or whatever, raise our voice and then to stand up and begin to make the change that's necessary to bring about the balance that's going to be necessary in order for the next generation to survive this onslaught that's going on. This is not complicated. So if you're watching the trial and you're watching it with the hope that it is going to change America, the part that's going to change America, you can see in the trial, if you've ever tried a case or if you've ever listened to anyone who has actually tried a case, that this is pomp and pageantry with an outcome that is probably predictable. But it won't change the practice, no matter how much people talk about policy. The people who are going to have to change the practice are going to be you and me and those of us who believe that there's a higher authority than the authority that exists right here, and that authority is calling on us to be the people who make the change. By virtue of the doctrine that we read each and every day and that we espouse on the street corner or at the masjid, or at the jailhouse, or at the uh, at the lecture, or on Zoom, it's in our hands, if we believe in this doctrine, to make the change, to fix it, because clearly it's broke. Clearly it is broke. This is Cultivating the Culture, 301-429-9247. I think I might have maybe two more minutes. I'm waiting for somebody to hit me with a note saying, sum up. Uh, in any event, again, I'm not a prognosticator, only Allah knows the future. Only the creator of the heavens and the earth knows all. So he knows the future. I don't pretend to know the future. I don't know whether Chauvin is going to be convicted. I have my predictions that I could make, but I don't want to influence any of you as you watch the trial. Um, but I also know that the more you see these kinds of incidents, the more they're screaming out for communities that have a doctrine that stands for justice, that can teach you how to stand for justice. That's the community that has to step forward. I'm wondering if you're a member of that community. 301-429-9247. I'm wondering if you're, as a member of that community, if you believe you are, are you standing somewhere? Are you lending your voice? Are you creating a, a space for those who need to heal? Are you helping? Or are you standing on the sideline hoping Ramadan cleans all your sins? Or hoping that uh, 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 you, 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 you save three Hail Marys and get forgiven? Whatever it is that you believe. Because the question really boils down to at the end of the day. What is it that you believe? And how is it that you commit that to your day? And to the day and the place where you are living and dying each and every day? Again, show is Cultivating the Culture. Your host, Tyrant Ibn Jamil Lang. And he's on every Sunday night at 8 o'clock from 8 to 9. It's now 9.05.
and uh, look forward to the very next time, the very next opportunity that we have to... Uh, oh, I got a nice little uh, text message on the show. All right, look, so they're asking me to keep going. So that means you got to help me keep going. All right, so do that. Um, let's talk about uh, the history. Because, again, I don't want you to get this trial outside of the parameters of the history. I started by telling you about uh, the immigration and how the immigration lets Europeans in. People think it's because they're refugees, they're fle fleeing this, that, and the third. No, they're letting them in for the same reason. They have been doing this throughout history, by the way, since 1619, for the same reason, 1656, 1676, for the same reason that they do it now. They allow Europeans to come in in order to cre increase those who would mark off white. If you remember, your Irish were not considered white when they first came in. They became white by virtue of a consensus that they agreed. Your Jews were not considered white. They became white later on because they needed an increase in the so-called white population. And one of the things that always happens with racism, white supremacy, is the adoption of white, which means that you have to adopt white to the exclusion of everything else. Meaning that white is the hierarchy and everything else beneath it has a category. The one at the bottom of that category is black. And so therefore, in 1856, when you read Dred Scott, and it says that a black man has no right, that a white man is bound to respect, you now understand the concept behind it. That this is white supremacy telling you that there's a hierarchy that is going to exist in America, and we will do everything we can to make sure that whites stay the predominant voice and the predominant people in the country. Imagine this. In New York, New York City alone, they have more population in New York City than they have in the entire state of Wyoming. Yet in the Senate, they have the same amount of power, which means that your if Wyoming is a so-called Republican state and New York is a so-called Democratic state, Wyoming can impact on the culture and the country the exact same with the exact same level of power as New York's New York which has 10 times more people. California having 10 times more people. So this country, this, this area that has 500,000 people are literally holding hostage 10 million people by their policy in the Senate. But that was a creation to make sure that those Western country, Western uh, Appalachian and, and majority white communities had some level of control and they wield that power undemocratically to the benefit of white supremacy and to the detriment to make sure that whites stay on top and minorities, people they consider to be minorities, stay at the bottom. And so why wouldn't? I mean, everybody who comes here scrambles pretending that they want to be part of the culture. They want to be part of the American dream. The American dream, believe it or not, is not the two the white picket fence and the White House and the two kids. It's the whiteness to be able to be acceptable to white America. That's the American dream. Even black people have that dream. The dream of being accepted by white America, which is why we accept the idea of what they say on CNN, MSNBC, etc. as it relates to trials and things that the black community should know better about. Like your virus and your health care and your prison industrial complex and your job opportunities and your po poverty and your unemployment and your stimulus. All designed for the exact same purpose. They all follow the same system. And so what? The one institution created for the purposes of making sure that all the other systems stay white dominated is policing. So you really do have people out there 
who are wondering why George Floyd is actually being, uh, 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 why um, Derek Chauvin is being charged and tried for the murder of this black man. That's his job. It was the job in 1775 when they started with slave catchers. It was 1850 when they created policing for the purpose of the fugitive slave law. You can go out and catch a slave and bring them back, you would have hunt them down. And sometimes you bring back the wrong person. And sometimes you kill the person you were bringing back. So they passed laws that suggest that if you killed a slave who was a runaway, you couldn't be charged because he wasn't a human being anyway. He was property. You were returning property. Only now we keep forgetting the history, but when you look at it as a continuum, as an ongoing process, you see why George Floyd's murder, which is which it was, is being treated differently in some circles than it is in other circles. This is why this whole thing about pumping this breakdown in the blue wall of silence, because it makes it look like, see, the, the cops are, aren't bad. They're coming out and testifying. They're telling the truth. They're finally breaking down this blue wall of science. They're going to, no, they're not. Again, there's a difference between what you say is your policy and what you say is your practice. Yeah, if you don't believe it, do it. Just take your Declaration of Independence. Take your United States Constitution. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. These are the same people who were holding slaves as they write down and whipping their slaves as they write it down and raping the slaves as they write it down. The policy was all men are created equal. The practice was enslavement, prisoners of war, extermination of Native Americans. The policy was all men are created equal. The practice was different. The only thing that Chauvin did and his training team was to expose the practice. So they have to sacrifice him. Even if it means just to put him on trial. So that the world will believe that America has turned the corner on racism, white supremacy in policing. But again, policing is set up with the purpose of protecting all the other systems. To protect and serve them. Not to protect and serve people especially black people because on the bottom of that they are protecting and serving them from the only people who have the necessity, the need for the culture to change. If I make a hundred thousand dollars and my family has benefited from slavery and the building of economy and now I own my own insurance company that was built on the back of selling off slaves etc etc and I'm making a hundred thousand every year six figures sometimes seven and my kids are going to the finest schools and they got computers and air conditioning and they got dividers separating because of COVID and they get their own health care. I got my own health care. Do you think I'm going to stop doing that so that you who have no health care, you who have inferior schools, you who have police still wanding kids as they come into your school? Broken down, run down neighborhoods, no health care, working menial jobs. You think I'm going to give all that up so that you could benefit? Because in order for me to benefit, I have to sacrifice. In order for you to benefit, I have to sacrifice what I lawfully earned, I believe. In order for you to move up the ladder. And if you moving up the ladder interferes with me moving up the ladder or staying up the ladder or maintaining my wealth, I'm not giving that up. That's not even common sense for you to ask me to give that up. You have to find a way to get your own. The unfortunate part about it is the only way for you to get your own is sometimes competing with people who have placed a ceiling on how far you can compete. Because they had the law and the right and the enforcement arm called the police to keep you down. The police and the law. The enforcement arm. The Derek Chauvins of the world. Let me go back to something that happened in the trial. 301. 
3-0-1-4-2-9-9-2-4-7. Let me go back to uh, uh, the, give me a second here. Let me go back to something that happened in the trial. This uh, argument that's being put out in the media about something called dueling experts. The original person who did the autopsy testified that George Floyd died from a heart attack. His heart gave out on him. The stress of the incident may have caused that, but no damage to his neck, no damage to his pharynx to indicate that he was choked. So he literally, this person, this, this expert, this pathologist, wrote a report that literally took the cause of death out of the hands, direct hands of the police. So this is why you never got a first degree murder charge, because standing on someone's neck for 10 minutes might believe might have the rest of the world believing like it has us believing that uh, it was intentional right you say an intentional murder you never you stand on somebody's neck and when you choke somebody out you intentionally trying to kill him everybody knows that but he's charged with unintentional murder because of the autopsy report now where did we see that before if you really want to see the history for those of you who remember let's just take a step back five years seven years to Freddie Gray Freddie Gray was a young man in Baltimore. Freddie Gray was, according to the witnesses on the street, bent like a pretzel by the police, and you could hear him screaming. And when they're dragging him to the car and the people begin to film, you could see he has no use of his legs. But when he gets down after he dies, the medical examiner does an autopsy on him and says that his neck was broken, yes, but it was broken by him slamming back and forth in the van as the van was moving at a high rate of speed. He literally took the murder off the street, the medical examiner took the murder off the street and put it in the van, thus taking all the culpability off of the police officers, with the exception of negligent driving, which eventually wound up in all the cases being dismissed because the one who did go to trial, jury was deadlocked. The second one went to trial with a judge and was clearly no judge is going to find culpability on a, an accident. It's just not, not, not going to happen. And so the rest of them were dismissed. But it was the state's representative, the medical examiner, who took the case from the prosecutor by taking it off the street and putting it in the van just by a simple report. Now, I understand that these experts came in and testified that it was suffocation because of the neck. If I'm defending that case, I mean, to me, it's kind of easy. First of all, nothing that they testified to was anything but speculation because none of them actually examined the body. So I would never have allowed testimony about cause of death coming from these people. If you are a pulmon pulmonologist, meaning that you're a lung person, breathing person, then you can testify as to what would happen in a circumstance where someone put weight on a particular person's body, how would that cut off his air, etc. But you couldn't testify that George Floyd died from that. It would be outside your area of expertise considering you did not examine the body and you're not a pathologist. But what happened in that case? Because that's what the guy testified to. Now the jury has at least the right to consider it. The defense didn't object to it. It makes me wonder why. Why didn't he object to it? Some people are speculating that he didn't object to it because he knew that the autopsy would come in and contradict all these things. But you don't take that kind of risk if you're really defending someone. You don't take that kind of risk in a case by not objecting. You don't allow that kind of stuff in. Normally, if you object, you at least observe, uh, preserve the matter for an appeal. That's why people object. So that when the appellate reviews it, the appellate court reviews it, if it goes to an appeal, you get to say, I objected to that. The judge ruled against me. And therefore, unless, of course, He's setting up something called plain error. Plain error is that it was something that happened in the courtroom that was so obviously in wrong that the judge should have stopped it. Even if the defense didn't interject with an objection. So I don't know what the strategy was on that, but 
anyone who did not examine the body should not be allowed to testify to cause of death. They are just speculating. They are guessing. The only person who's allowed to do that is the medical examiner. And since he took the choke out of the case and turned it into a heart-related stress complicated by fentanyl. By the way, in my post, I spell fentanyl P-H- P-H-E as opposed to F-E. I don't know what was on my mind. But, I mean, you, you understand the dynamics of what's ebbing and flowing around here. So the pundits are out there waiting for this dueling expert thing. When in fact, maybe the defense will call a hundred experts to refute the experts that came on. But he could have done that easily by denying them access to testifying about the cause of death by just subjecting to it. The judge would have probably ruled it's irrelevant or it's speculation. You didn't examine the body. How can you testify as to what he died from? You can testify to what you saw in the videos. You can testify what you think that means as to whether or not his breathing, he stopped breathing here, he just that the third. But you can't testify that that caused his death. So it makes me wonder when Waquil called and he talked about he's seeing some really shaky lawyering. I'm seeing some really shaking lawyer, shaky lawyering there. I had to compliment uh, uh, Mr. Blackwell, the prosecutor in this case, the black one. Um, they say he never tried a criminal case, but his uh, so maybe this trial is within the parameters of his uh, of his uh, expertise as how he examines. But. But that's just what it is. Um, but none of these guys can testify to it. And so maybe the defense is just relying on the autopsy as he has been to say that fentanyl, methamphetamines, uh, closed clogged valves, the stress of the circumstance, he died. You know, so if my client had, you know, was just doing his job, etc. The force might have been a little bit excessive, but it had nothing to do with what caused his death. The stress of the incident in and of itself caused his death. I don't know how that's going to play out in front of a jury, but I know the jury heard it. And so um, that's just simply the way it is. And, uh, and I'm hoping that, again, I don't have any hopes for this trial. I'm hoping that our community is educated enough to begin to see how easily it is or how easily they think as a culture it is to manipulate our community. This is why I'm calling on the faith-based community. Because you have a doctrine separate and apart from your average citizen who may not have faith as part of their 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 agenda, as part of who they are. You have a higher thought process than the average person who is just loves to listen to Don Lemon or listen to Court TV. You have a different hopefully a different argument, discussion, ethos that you bring to the table. 301-429-9247. And those of you who have called already, don't be shy about calling back. It's not, it's, 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 this is not uh, 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 one of those shows where I get to chop your head off. Remember Mort Downey he used to just chop people's head off when they called in? Or now you can go, and if you call in on Fox and you get Tucker Carlson, you might get, he might hunt you down on the street. Now, I want to just, again, the, the, the issue always is going to be, what do we gather from it? Because we're here trying to cultivate a culture. All right. I don't don't text me because then I interrupt the show. Just call me on the phone. Don't be shy. I'm not. I'm. I, I, I can't text you back in the middle of the, of the the broadcast. So that's why we open up the phone line, so that uh, you could all uh, call in, and with your two cents. Um. Uh, I'm I'm really hoping that we'll get uh, a couple of calls from some people who are who have been either jurors or. Etc. to give an idea of what it is that we're about. So, since we're doing that, let's go back to the phone, see if we have a caller. Good evening. Good Welcome call. to Cultivating the Culture. Yeah. This is... Uh, or, to give an idea of what it is that we're about. So, oh, you there? Hello? 
Yes, sir. Okay. Who, um, who's calling? Hey. Hey. Salam alaikum. Talk to me. Tell me where you're calling from, first of all. I'm calling from Atlanta. Okay. Atlanta. Love. We're all over the place tonight. Okay. I'm glad yeah, the, ba- the ATL. Y'all beat uh, Charlotte tonight on a good game. Probably the great <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me. Talk to me, brother. Give me some give me some insights. Tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me if I, you should think I'm right. Tell me where we can make what we got to do to move forward. Talk to me. I mean, my, I, I was listening to what you said. The people going to step up. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and I think at this point, it's safe to say that that's nothing they can do to a black person to make the black community step up and, and come and become united. Like, if, you know, they show many times why they're killing children, killing old ladies, you know, and nothing was done. People come out, they march because it seems like it's the thing to do of the moment for social media. So there's really no real movement mm-hmm. after these things are done. We march about it, we cry about it, we laugh about it, and we, and we keep it pushing, right? Like, it already becomes a point where this is just what happens to us in this country. Mm-hmm. They feel like it's an accepted thing. Is that is that an issue of a lack of faith? I mean, do we just accept that 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 this is supposed to happen to this community? Is that something that we we as, a, as a, and I, I want to again keep the issue of faith in in this? Is that that we just have given in to second class citizenship and and we don't believe we deserve better, or are our doctrine not educating us to believe that we must make it better? I don't think that's about the education. I think it's a, a unwillingness to sacrifice because in order for real change to come, people there's going to have to be some sacrifices made, mm-hmm. whether they're monetary, lives, freedom, change of lifestyle. And I don't, I, I don't see the people willing to do that. You know, I see the marches. I hear people. They say, "Do you march?" I say, "I don't." They're like, "Why not?" You think we have issues? Or we got plenty of issues, but marching ain't going to fix none of them. So when you hear people start calling for boycotts and they say, oh, let's boycott this company, the black people don't even have a discipline to do that. Right, but you, I'm not going to spend my money with this particular company. They can't even do something as simple as not spend their money. That, so when you talk about sacrifices, it, it, that just seems like too much. What, what faith community are you from? You're Muslim? I'm Muslim. Okay, so let's assume now that the issue is thrown squarely in the Muslim's ballpark. We need you all to take the lead. The black community comes to you and says, we need you. We understand you all have a doctrine that says we stand for truth no matter who is for, who is against. We stand for justice even if it's against ourselves. We need you to take the stand and take the lead on it. What, do the, what, what, what would you tell the Muslims to do? First thing, after they, after they make uh, 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 Salah, Istikara. I mean, I, I, I would have to go and see, you know, we had to follow an example of the messenger of the law as far as building communities, how, how that would go, you know, and, and in that order. If it's establishing the Salat, establishing the, what the community is really here for, taking care of the people on the lower end of the community, making sure that they got what they need, and getting away from the materialism. Because I, I don't see the people, like, when you look at the history and the people that does boycotts and stuff like that, Everything, every change was people was willing to sacrifice and say, okay, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to be for this community. Right. And I hear a lot of it, we need to do this, we need to do this. But doing that means stop doing other things. Mm-hmm. So, and to the people willing to stop doing other things, I, I don't see how you're going to go past that. I, I don't, it, it seems like the, you, you skip the too many steps. And when I hear people, oh, the black lives, the black lives, and, Black people don't even buy themselves unless they wear white people clothes. Mm-hmm. So the same, we gotta, there's too many things that need to be done on the ground level. Like, we gotta have some type of self pride and respect and love before you can do all this other stuff. Because mm-hmm. if I don't feel like I'm nothing with all the white man clothes on, but I'm in the street screaming Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. it, it just don't make sense to me. Do we have it within the Islamic community to, to be able to say, if we can get black people to change this one thing? that we can, that they can uh, 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 begin to make the change. Do we have it within the Islamic community to say that? I mean, I, I would have to say the one thing is to, to worship Allah in, in correctness, in the right way, because that just encompasses everything. When you live in the 
to please Allah, a lot of other things don't matter. When you live in to please God, certain things that we value and we look to as, you know, a big deal, they don't become such a big deal no more. The name of your clothes don't become a big deal no more. The name of your car don't become a big deal no more. If your girl got a fat butt, don't become a big deal no more. So, there's so many things, the size of your house, all these things that really don't mean nothing, when they don't mean nothing, you see the difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we we so far from that that I, I just I don't see how people think that uh, one person dying. Because I hear black people all the time when a black person get die. Oh, well, you shouldn't did this and you shouldn't did that. And I'm not, you know, it's really no one. Even when the children, oh, why did they do this? But you don't hear black people or Asian people blaming the kid when they call these children. Mm -hmm. None of them do it. Mm -hmm. But you are all in this course, it's not all black people, but you, it's so easy to find them to do it. It's like, like why are we always so ready to jump on the bandwagon? But I, I, don't, I, I don't have an answer to that, but... Well, alhamdulillah, so many other problems. Well, bro brother, I think your 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 commentary uh, is 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 powerful. I think it's brilliant. I think it gives me a, a, another segue into another discussion. So, shukram, thank you for calling. Inshallah, you continue to listen. And hey, if you're throwing nothing Thursday night at eight o'clock, join us on the Raw Law Project at HSRN. All right, oh, salam alaikum. That was intriguing. Um, um, now you have at least from. Uh, a member of the faith-based community, uh, 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 the Islamic faith-based community, suggesting that the that when you trust in the Creator and you believe in a Creator, that that Creator has power over all things, you don't find that which is associated so much with the secular to be that important. And one of the problems that the community is always going to have here in America is that America makes the material more important than the faith. And so, therefore, uh, 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 your, your your car becomes your god. Your 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 job becomes your god. You worship that more. Uh, and so, therefore, now we have a faith discussion going on as to how we resolve these issues. Let's go back to the line and see if we can find some more issues. Welcome. This is cultivating the culture. Who am I speaking with? Target and Jamil again. Oh, what's up? It's Target and Jamil again. Don't be shy about calling in. Hey, well, you know. You said, I mean, uh, loving the show, loving the issue, uh, loving the participation that we're getting from the audience. And, and the subject is important for us to, you know, to, 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 to manifest, you know. I mean, you know, the things that we look at, the, our two greatest, you know, last leaders, you know, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, both, both were men of God. And both of them, you know, led people, and, and they followed the rules and regulations according to their book, and, they, and that's what they, they preach. They preach the rules and regulations to their book. And then when the leadership started being independent of that, we went astray. And that's what's happening. People, like you say, okay, one man's death, this was an assassination. It was clear, you know, the situation, and people up up arms. But the souls of our people are dying. Mm -hmm. Our souls are being sold, and we have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. Because, oh, well, they're black, and they're allowed to be creative. You will lose your mind. Cause you, and you should, because of that, this individual that was a criminal that was in the uniform, and he did his own personal hate and business and, and assassinated somebody. And that's terrible. But yet we have these people that are, are doing things and sending people to the devil, mm -hmm. sending people so you can worship the devil, you know, saying that, that, that this is all right to do pornography at the Grammy, do pornography on, on the regular thing. And we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. People are not saying that. People are not losing their minds because these souls are being lost. So when we say faith, what is the faith? Is your faith in democracy? Is your faith in the Democratic Party? Is your faith in TV? But if your faith is in the creator of existence, then you have to go by the revelations that he sent, whether he's going by the revelation that he sent to Moses, whether he sent to Jesus, and whether he sent to Muhammad, all of them call for you as followers of him to stand against it. But yet, we will just turn our cheek to this assault and the assassination of the characters of great individuals and, and the work that we've done as a people and the fear that we have and now we just comment, you know, man, just doing what we want to do. So, you know, How do you, like, how, let me man, interrupt you for a second. How do you, if, if you believe that, how do you establish your faith so that other communities can see 
the benefit the of is, the benefit of the this thing, faith? How do you establish that? The thing is, is our creator said that he said, save yourself and your family from mm -hmm. a fire that's fueling in the stones. So you first have to work with yourself. One of the biggest things that was messed up with leadership is leadership. You know, they were saving the world, but they abandoned their children. Then their children were going to mock. And so you have a responsibility to do that. And as you save yourself and you save your, your child, then you're, and you make sure that your child has good company and kids around, you, you have a concern for the other kids. So you have a concern for the next generation. So you're being an example to these other, the next generation. And so you're growing and developing yourself, working on your heels to be a good father, be a good parent. And then you have that child and they grow up. And then those kids that, that, that are younger, they grow up and that's a generation. But you build in your community. That's how it was before. When I was young, when I was young in the 60s and in the, in the, in the, in the late 70s and stuff, I'm early 70s, and during that time, there were great leaders on our community. We didn't look for the national leader, and that was it. And by seeing real-life people, seven examples, that made the change. Mm -hmm. We have to go back to that. This this imagery, this falseness, the people that we will never see in our lives and stuff, and making them our heroes and our examples is, 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 is something we have to remove ourselves from. So first, we have to go back to local leadership. And we have to go back to individuals saving yourself, save your family, and, and set a good example. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, then it's real. And then, of course, we need to start volunteering in these facilities, in the juvenile facilities, in the prison, and the other places, and start volunteering, you know, with our time and be able to assist. Because we're always talking about what they should do, where they're not going to do it. So we have to do it by volunteering. We have to put, put up, you're saying, put ourselves on, on the front line, put our faith on the front line so the, so the world can see how it's supposed to be done. Yeah, because the thing is, is this, they make it, like I was, the last show, I was talking about, you know, growing up in the Bronx and stuff, and growing up in the Bronx, I, my, 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 my mom was spiritual, even though, you know, we was with, with the nation, and then, you know, the, my mother left, and my father, you know, still went into full Islam and everything, but we grew up, my mom was always spiritual, so when I t started studying Islam, I saw the spiritualness of a people that, that, and that, that believed that this man had an angel coming to him over a 23 year period that was giving the message of God, that's spiritual. That's not that. That's not that's that's not some some book thing, you see. And so you know, this is this is how this is how you make that change by being that example by believing it. And when people see you really believe that, mm -hmm. you really believe that Moses parted the water. You really believe that Jesus was able to to, to make a bird uh, and, and give it life, make it in the form. You really believe that these that, that God raised them up to the heavens with the book said because the book starts off in this book there is no doubt. And when you live a life like that, and they see that you really believe it, and they see that you also, that, you know, I'm from the Bronx, I could deal with anybody and stuff, I see these rappers and stuff, those, those, that's not real. But when people see that you really believe that, that's when the change happens. They have to see people really believe in it, in a way in, in that they understand. But when it's something foreign, they don't understand that. So they're going to go to something familiar, and familiar in our society is leading you astray to wow. the devil. That's interesting. You know, and it's funny, too, because I remember the late, great Ahmed Didad, said in a, a lecture once he said that this is a crazy culture they w they will worship anything they worship their money they worship the devil they worship their hair they worship anything they're looking for something to worship and the people who have the right worship are standing back when they should be in the forefront saying here since you will worship anything let me give you proper worship for example a good example you know here we, we, we have this cancel culture right Mm -hmm. The cancer culture is a heterophobic culture. Mm -hmm. I'm a heterosexual. I am proud to be heterosexual. I am proud to teach my children heterosexuality. So I should be able to have, you know, heterosexual pride day. But if I do it, oh, what's happening? So if you guys wanted to be involved in your uh, pride day, okay, we're having heterosexual pride day. We need you to support us. Oh, well, hold up. We need you to, to push this program of heterosexuality because that's what we believe in. And if those that ascribe to that, which is the majority of the people, would stand up and say, I'm a heterosexual and I'm proud, and this is what I want to teach my kids, it's nothing against you, because you came around after. We've been around. This is how my father taught me. This is my grandfather taught me. This is my great-grandfather taught me. This is my great 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 This is what they've been teaching me. And this is what I believe in. So you do what you want to do, but for mine, I, I'm a heterosexual. I mean, you know, <laughs> this is my program. And if I stand up like that, I'm seen as opposition, that shows that those people, your opposition control you. Think about it. I love Imagine it. having heterosexual, you know, it's heterophobic. When I, I put up the word, I said heterophobic. Heter heterophobic. And somebody's like, what? That's not a word. Okay, we go. <laughs> um, homophobic wasn't a word 30 years ago. But heterophobic is a word because, you know, when I, I'm proud to be a heterosexual and I talk about it and, you know, it's like, oh, okay, okay, I need you guys to support. I need you to teach it in the schools. Well, no, wait, wait, well, no, <laughs> you teach an then teach, teach what I believe. And I hold strong to it. This is, I mean, what's wrong with that?
Powerful, that's powerful, what I powerful stuff, man, brother. Powerful stuff. Dude. That's that's one reason why I always tune into your show. You always get when, and all I gotta do is get you riled up, and then I know you're gonna bring, bring the heat. I know you're gonna bring the <laughs> no, heat. I appreciate that. It, man. I mean, it's good to see something. Like I said, people don't understand. White supremacy media controls the thinking of our people. Correct. When they started in 19, no, 1916, when, when Wilson, uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson showed that film, uh, uh, A Birth of a Nation, at the White House, it was not just because he was stupid and he thought it was the greatest movie. He showed, look, this is the new weapon. Mm-hmm. We control their minds through this media, this visualization, because people don't read and they remember more. And we can give you a straight lie and say it's the truth. They were a short amount of time removed from the Civil Wars, mm-hmm. removed from when we had pitched back as the first black governor, removed from blacks starting this public school system and all that in the 1880s and 1890s and all of that. Mm-hmm. There was a short amount of time, just 20 years. That was That's close. That's like talking about something that happened in 1990. Right. They're showing movies about them like buffoons and clowns eating watermelon at the Congress and all of that. And that's they're right. showing it and the people took it as well. And then they showed it to the rest of the white people and, and, and called them to riot and hang blacks. That's why you had all of these things that was going on at the time. People don't look and you saw they saw that reaction from a movie and taking it to the ignorant and showing them and thinking that that's real and having them cause them to do things to our blacks when they were coming back from the war, from World War One. And they always have a cycle. Every time we come back from war, they don't want to get us back in check. World War One, they did it, and World War Two, they did it, and then Vietnam, they did it with that, the heroin and, and the crack and all of that. Which is exactly what I always say about if you look at it as a continuum, a continued process of degrading and destroying the mind then you'll see the picture. But if you look at it as isolated incidents, like George Floyd got a trial and, and George Floyd died, it's an isolated incident, then you'll miss the fuller picture. You'll miss the propaganda behind exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Adolf Hitler wrote Mein Kampf in 1925, mm-hmm. 100, over 100 years ago almost. Mm-hmm. And these individuals are still reading his book, and he is their teacher. They're taking his notes, applying his notes, applying it. This other guy wrote a book in 1978, a ton of diaries, and, you talk, and they're still reading it. So they are still taking the techniques of destruction from the people of old. While well, yet we reject the statements of the people of old and don't even study it. They're successful because you're talking about a hundred-year implementation of oppression. Mm-hmm. But we just, you know, I'm going to come up with my own thing. <laughs> <laughs> or we're going to accept the thing that come from a people that don't have the same, uh, that, that don't live in the same desert. You know what I mean? That they, you, right. I always used to say that someone who lives in a green grass field is going to practice Islam differently than someone who lives in a desert. Right. Exactly. You know? Because <laughs> I can walk in my field and pick a grape and say Bismillah. You can't walk in your field and pick a grape in no desert. You have to come up with another thing. You might say Bismillah when you eat the scorpion. But <laughs> picking right. a grape and being able to bathe in some water is different than able to, having to make tayamum and etc. like that in the sand. So exactly. you, you got to make I'm, those. You know, Allah wa ta, yeah, as they traveled, and that's why he sent it because there were parts that they went to there was no water. And so what happens? Do we not pray? Mm-hmm. Allah said, "No, I make the adjustment. This is my earth. I created it, so I know over the earth the difference is where we have water, where we don't have water, and I still make it for my servant to be able to submit to me." There you go. No excuses. There you go. There you go. Yep. So, all, all right, brother man, keep up the good work. Do man. your thing. <laughs> Inshallah. Go get them. Go get them. I'll, I'll, I'll say Salaam something. Alaykum. Within the next 10 minutes, I'm going to say something else and make you call back. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, that's Tyreek Ibn Jamil. Now, those of you who follow his show, then you know that that's uh, when he gets on his uh, when he gets fired up, which I always try to fire him up. Um, he can really spout some uh, some some powerful powerful information for you all. Uh, but please don't discount the fact that uh, it's a history of propaganda, a history of attempting to control black thought here in America, and the antithesis to controlling black thought here in America is your faith. Uh, it, they can't control you if you are controlled by your creator. If you are following what your creator says, someone else can't step in between that. When you see them stepping in, you see it for what it really is, a diversion from off that straight path that your creator placed you on. And therein lies what I'm seeing here with this particular trial. Uh, you know what justice looks like. Come on, let's stop pretending we don't know what, what, what foul play looks like. 
after 600 years of dealing with uh, 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 the European e e evisceration of uh, so-called African consciousness. We know after 600 years, we know the, 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 the transfer of, 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 of information and how it moves people to a particular mindset. This is what jury trials are supposed to do. I'm supposed to, on the prosecutor, get you to see something. Get you to believe something beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm on the defense. I'm supposed to get, protect my client's right by showing you maybe another side that could create a doubt in your mind as to what the prosecutor is doing. And if I can show that the prosecutor is literally manipulating the evidence, then I can put the system on trial. And if I'm a defense attorney and if I don't have the system to put on trial and all I can put on trial is the victim, then I'm putting the victim on trial. And I'm using, because I got six white people on the jury, at least six, and we know that from the most recent election, that six out of every ten people who voted, who were white, voted for Donald Trump. So we know, basically, we have an idea as to what the mindset is if you get six of them on the jury then why is anybody complaining, this is what they're thinking as part of their propaganda tool, why is anybody complaining that they're putting George Floyd on trial? We've been putting George Floyd on trial since Amistad. We've been putting George, trial, uh, George on trial since Bacon's Rebellion in the 1600s. We've been doing that all along. We always play the stereotype. We always obscure the facts. We always overlook the conduct of white males as it relates to black males in the culture. Why is anybody complaining about that? That's how it's done. But it's only done when people who put their sense of justice to the side and follow the lead of what has always been done. That's why faith is more important than anything. Your faith, your, your doctrine that teaches you that the best of you is the one who's best to his neighbor. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. These kind of concepts say, I got to implement something here. The best of you is best to his, to his neighbor. So then therefore I gather my dates because I don't know whether my, my dates have, my neighbor has dates and I take him some or her some. I go borrow some salt from my neighbor even though I know they don't really have anything to give because they can feel like they're giving. So when they come to me asking, they won't feel like they're uh, in position. Faith, the kind of doctrine that says this is how I move. This is, this is what's going to make me move in a particular direction. This is what's going to make me have concerted action, do in action. Faith, that's what cultivating the culture gives you each and every week. A dialogue about your faith and the history that comes with people of faith. And this culture will never turn around without people placing something above that which they have given you in the culture as being the new God, the dollar. Everybody knows we worship the dollar. The job. Come on, those of you who know you're supposed to be praying and it's time for the job, your TV show. Y'all know y'all shouldn't be watching Queen Latifah when it's time for Isha. As much as I like Queen Latifah. <laughs> You place that in the way of your God. Justice. You know that in, injustice is being occurred right in front of you, but you refuse to do anything about it. Well, it's, and it, it hasn't hurt me. If you're from the, 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 the Jewish tradition, you know you have the statement from one of your scholars. They came for X in the morning and I did nothing. And then they came for Y in the afternoon and I did nothing. And they came for Z in the evening and I did nothing. And the next day they came for me 
and there was no one around to help me to do anything. You did nothing. You got what you deserve. You got what you deserve. When they, when the, when the young white boy walked into the church, by the way, it was a hit. It wasn't just a crazy white boy. The preacher from that church had just given a major address, moving him into the level of the discussion of national black leadership. Two days later, a white boy walks into his church with a nine millimeter and kills nine people in the church, including him. In the media, they portrayed it as a white boy lost his mind, out of control, etc. But they never tell you about the dynamic of this dynamic potential leader of that community as being the reason for that hit, a reason for that church of all churches. So you take it as an isolated incident and you say, this guy, uh, this crazy man did X, Y, Z. No, it was a hit. He wasn't crazy. He was doing the same thing that they did in the brother from, uh, from North Carolina. He was doing the same thing that they did there. The governor, the Senate, all controlled by black people. But they couldn't take it. They couldn't rule, be ruled, controlled by black people. That means vote, black people's votes are being counted. Just like this preacher here in the church in South Carolina was getting people riled up to vote and participate in the process. Get rid of him. Get rid of Wilmington, Delta, Wilmington, North Carolina. Burn it down. Kill all of them, all of them, and we'll have a new election. It's not new. George Floyd is not new. It's part of a continuum. But the people of faith are the only thing in between. This is why they attacked faith originally. They didn't give you the Bible. This, they didn't practice the same Bible that you practiced, the one that they gave you in 1600 and 1700 and 1800. That Bible and that Christianity that they gave you was a docile Christianity. Not the kind that a, 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 a Jesus Christ and Isa ibn Maryam came in and knocked over the table and called out the robber barons and called out the, the, the people of vice and challenged them. They didn't give you that because that meant you might adopt that and want to challenge them. So they gave you one, a slave is obedient to his master. They tried the same thing with Islam. When the Persians grabbed the hold of Islam, they had come from a Greco-Roman, uh, 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 Persian idol worship culture, and they tried to infuse that and begin to turn Islam into something that was a little bit more consistent with what they knew in their culture. They tried the same thing. This is why you read all these books and the only black person that they mention is Bilal, like the entire culture wasn't same or similar. And then they call him Abyssinian as opposed to calling him an Arab when they trace their ancestry, say his father was a quote-unquote black Arab. This is why they do that. And we fall for the propaganda. We run around thinking that Christianity is a white religion, Judaism is a white religion, uh, that, and all of it is separate and apart from that there's one creator, and why would he give us 150 religions? When he can just give us one. One that says nothing has the right to be worshipped but the creator. Makes common sense. But if you can get people separated by all these different things, then they'll put their, something else ahead of their faith. Their color. So we create a color barrier. White, black, white on the top, black on the bottom, yellow, brown, all these color descriptions. And then call it race. And so watch, watch race play out over and over in these kind of trials until the people of faith step up and say, race is irrelevant. The best of you is the best in conduct. But conduct is an action. What do you do that creates conduct? And then you have to look at your conduct and say, where, what do I stand for? I'm not a, a protester. 
I'm a communicator. I'm a trial attorney or a former trial attorney. So, I mean, that's where we are. So as you watch this trial and the other trials that come along, should there come along some, or the other killings as they come along, should they come along, ask yourself, where do I fit in here? When the church was killed, every person who was of that faith and of any faith should have seen it for what it was and rallied with the doctrine of that faith to make the change. Now, I know there's a faith out there that says you forgive everybody. Yeah, but you forgive, but then you also protect yourself. That would be commonsensical. I forgive him, but I'm going to protect my community. I'm going to rally those people who have the same or similar. I'm going to step forward in this and challenge the doctrine that would allow this kid to come through and kill up the whole neighborhood. One aside, one sidebar. For all of you who are Muslims, Jamil al is still in prison. Jamil al is still in prison on bogus charges. Jamil al is still in prison on charges that not just go to the, 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 the fabrication of evidence, but also go to his history as being a leader of the Muslims in America. We see him really, even to this day, we say Jamil Halamine, but we see H. Rap Brown. Because the government sees H. Rap Brown. The government has taught us that he's H. Rap Brown, not Jamil Halamine, the person who the masjids in the 19, early 1980s, the masjids around the country, the Muslim, so called Sunni Muslims around the country, elected as the national leader, national spokesman. The Jamil Halamine who wrote uh, uh, Revolution by the Book. Talking about Revolution by the Quran, how the Quran talks about the complete overthrow or change of a system and how it completely changes the system if you implement the Quran and the Sunnah of the Rasulullah I'm asking you to just think about George Floyd in this trial because again it always these kind of incidents called on you to have faith to, to deal with your faith to put your faith out in front Jamil al did that changed the whole community down there in Atlanta but he had to get out of Atlanta because they still haven't child, child, solved the Atlanta child murders. Wouldn't it be interesting if that's one of the reasons why they got him out of there? Out of Atlanta? You see what Atlanta is like now. The brother who's from Atlanta, you tell him what Atlanta is like right now. We are the, we are the people of faith are the community the world has been waiting for. We have been transplanted from all over the world, especially the so-called so-called black people here. You have been transported from every place in the world, and Allah, the Creator, still blessed you with faith to remember Him. You think He stuck you here for accident? Or did He stick you here for the purpose of seeing whether you would be willing to step forward and take the lead in the culture? The lead in everything. If you're a scientist, you should run it. And therefore run it for the benefit of your own children and let the world see your children so that they will want to be like your children. If you're a guest speaker, then you need to be the best speaker so that the people will see you and say, I want to be like him. If you're a ball player, you may not be LeBron, but you may be Kyrie. And there's nobody better. To be willing to step forward and take the lead is what faith is all about. Because your generation, you're the shepherd of. So what happens when they come for your family? And there's no one there who has set the stage, who has taken their faith serious enough to take the stage so that you have some backing. I know we say, well, we trust in Allah. Yeah, we trust in Allah. Rasulullah is trusting in Allah and he built communities. He established masjids. He connected muhajirs with ansars. He created brotherhood. And then the world woke up and said, look at what they're doing in Medina. Look at what they're doing here. And the world hasn't been the same since. 
the sense of putting your faith first, even in circumstances like this, is what faith is all about. This has been Cultivating the Culture. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have been your host, Muhammad Bashir. For all of you who called in, thank you. Continue to call into programs like this. Continue to make your voices heard. Stand up for what you say you stand up. Stand up for what you say you believe in. Don't let anybody convince you that this culture stands for you. You are the one who was sent here to change the culture. Let's get together and do it. In the name of Allah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I'm gone. See you next week inshallah if Allah wills. And we're out. <laughs>